It was a reddish, human-like bite mark, described by Dr. Mariano B. Lara in his official account of Clarita Villanueva, it is said to have appeared on the troubled young woman's body in 1953 during a state of partial trance. The wound was fresh, moist even, and bore distinct impressions that were mostly from the form of the front or incisor teeth. The only issue was, Clarita hadn't been bitten at least not by anything human, at least not by anything visible. The wound was inexplicable. And sensationally, this was not the only time that the 18-year-old Filipina woman was said to have been attacked and bitten by a pair of dark aggressors, which she collectively called the Thing. Imprisoned in Manila's old beloved prison after being arrested for vagrancy, Clarita Villanueva experienced two weeks of terrifying altered states of consciousness, during which she was mysteriously assaulted and bitten by devils, with physical wounds being observed by multiple witnesses, including doctors. Indeed, according to a reporter for the United Press, Clarita was surrounded by about 100 medical specialists, nurses and pressmen, with fellow inmates and prison guards also testifying to her strange behaviour. Before too long, international media dubbed her the Dracula Girl, with the bizarre happenings and the reasons for them unresolved to this day. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Clarita Villanueva travelled to the Philippine capital city of Manila in search of her father. The youngest of four children, she had been forced to fend for herself after her mother died when she was just 12 years old. Abandoned by her older brothers and with no other immediate family to care for her, she wondered whether her father, an absent unknown who she had never met and indeed knew nothing of, might be interested in her. And so it was, not even knowing if he were alive, that an impoverished Clarita found herself on the streets of Manila, at first a maid and then, when that ended badly, struggling to survive as a dance hostess in bars and taverns. On the 6th of May 1953, desperate and soliciting illegal activities in order to survive, an 18-year-old Clarita was arrested by a plainclothes police officer. It was to Manila's old Bilibid prison that she was taken to await trial a colossal, six-acre penal facility notorious for overcrowding and poor conditions that had functioned as a prisoner of war camp during Japanese occupation of the island. Placed in a cell with two other women, Clarita passed two days without remark. It was on the third day, in the middle of the night, that the first strange thing is said to have happened. Stones were heard hitting the floor of her cell. Waking Clarita and her cellmates, there was no obvious origin to the sound, with the prison guard who was summoned to their door telling the women to be quiet and return to sleep. So disturbed, Clarita struggled to rest, most especially when she realised she was being watched by something in the darkness of the cell. Up within the beams of the room was, so she later claimed, a thing. It was then that Clarita was attacked. Pinned to the bed by whatever had just leapt down from the beam so as to be on top of her, she was savagely bitten, screaming and all but paralysed by fear. Her cellmates once again woke, with the guard similarly returning to the door. When questioned and asked what had happened, Clarita repeated that it had been the thing. Encouraged to elaborate, the terrified young woman described how she had been attacked by two figures some manner of short creature with white hair, an angelic face and a big moustache, and an evil-looking man dressed entirely in black. The latter had been tall and covered in hair. Both had bitten her, and even as she explained to the original guard and the others who were fast arriving at the cell, were continuing to do so. Not only that, there were bite marks on her body to prove it, with the prison guards later testifying that they had indeed seen the many red circular wounds manifest in real time on the young woman's torso, neck, shoulders, upper arms and leg just above the knee. Certainly, according to one contemporary account printed in the Philippines Free Press, it appeared as though Clarita was being attacked by an invisible monster, with her cowering in stark terror, screaming in blood-curdling agony before wilting to the floor, 
As for the wounds, sometimes she did not need to point to the fresh teeth marks on her arms or neck, because the bites were too pronounced to escape notice. With the attack ongoing and seemingly unable to be stopped, it was impossible for prison staff to calm the young woman, and so the prison chaplain, along with a police medic and the chief of the Manila Police Department, were summoned to the cell. They were able to extract more information from the terrified young woman, including further details as to the appearance of the thing, before she eventually calmed. All in all, she is said to have endured 20 separate bites that night. The following day, the story was published in a daily newspaper, with it said that the larger of the two attackers had bore two fangs and large, sharp eyes. He had supposedly spoken to Clarita in a deep voice and had curly hair all over his body. Big and dark, descriptions of the unearthly predator were likewise featured in a story published by another Philippine paper the following day again. And so, before too long, all of the Philippines knew of the girl who had been bitten by devils. As for those at the prison, an initial investigation led to a diagnosis of insanity, with it said by the medical staff of the Manila Police Department that Clarita had simply bit herself during epileptic fits. Subsequently, another medical authority declared her affliction, and presumably the bites which manifest on her body, to be a simple case of malnutrition. Another, an army psychiatrist at the Victoriano Luna General Hospital, concluded that Clarita's case was one of hysterical fugue. Succinctly, the past trauma, marked by sudden travel or wandering away from home, had caused her to enter a disassociative state in which she had attacked herself, then blamed it on unseen monsters. And yet, none of this could explain what those at the prison had seen with their own eyes the inexplicable appearance of bite marks, red, moist and toothed, on the skin of a young woman who seemed to be under attack by an invisible force. For indeed, according to an employee at the jail who spoke with the Philippines Free Press, the strange manifestations were like the wind. The wind cannot be seen, but it can inflict physical damage, just like the thing. Unseen, but undoubtedly real. After the first night, things did not improve for Clarita. The incarcerated woman, for whatever reason, was still crying in agony, writhing and convulsing, displaying eerie and unearthly bite marks all over her body. Being seemingly bitten to insanity, in moments of lucidity, she was able to confide that she had been experiencing such attacks before her arrest, with the 3rd of May supposedly marking the start of her torment. Now under the care of the Chief Medical Examiner of the Manila Police Department, Dr. Mariano Lara, Clarita was once again subjected to professional scrutiny. According to Dr. Lara's report, he found the woman to be nervous and childish, as was befitting her young age, with his request on the 13th of May to examine the bite marks being initially circumvented. Clarita, so he wrote, told him to return to her cell later in the day, sometime past midday, about two o'clock, when the thing causing the bites would come again. From his report, it is clear that, like his assistant before him, Dr. Lara did not entertain the notion of an invisible thing having caused the bites, and instead suspected epilepsy, and maybe even insanity. Still, Clarita's well-being was an ongoing concern, with her rapidly developing a fever. And so it was, at 2.30pm on the 13th of May, after a brief trip to the hospital, Clarita was brought to his office. According to the doctor's official report, she was unconscious and entirely insensitive to all stimuli and had to be carried in, her state presumably caused by having endured yet another entranced attack by the thing. Once she began to rouse, Dr. Lara was able to examine her injuries. Her arms, so he reported, bore reddish human-like bite marks. Not only that, a fresh one manifested in the middle of his examination. According to the doctor's description, Clarita was in a semi-trance and cried out in pain when it happened. And so, much to his disbelief, Dr. Lara had become a witness to the phenomenon. I saw, so he wrote, with my unbelieving eyes, the clear marks of impressions of human-like teeth from both the upper and lower jaws. 
Horrifically, the area that had been bitten was a little moist, with Dr. Lara concluding that he could not find any possible explanation insofar as my human experience in medical training is concerned. Simply put, it was a mystery. In this way, Dr. Lara went on to share his examinations in a 45-minute radio broadcast. This broadcast caught the attention of Lester Sumrall, an American Pentecostal pastor and missionary who believed in the power of miracles. And Clarita Villanueva, he was determined, would be his miracle. In his later written account, Sumrall described praying to God, asking him to deliver Clarita from her suffering. Suffering which, after listening to Dr. Lara's broadcast, he was convinced was supernatural in origin. God, so Sumrall claimed, replied to him in his heart, telling him, if you will go to the jail and pray for her, I will deliver her. Hence, this is exactly what Lester Sumrall did. Sumrall, who, along with his family, spent many years in the Philippines during the 1950s, arranged to meet with Mayor Arsenio Laxon, requesting that he be allowed to visit Clarita in prison so as to pray for her. Already acquainted with the case, the mayor had been in the process of seeking a Catholic exorcism for the young woman, and so was happy to assign Sumrall to her case. When Dr. Lara, who was still ultimately responsible for Clarita's care, was asked his opinion, he was reportedly convinced, telling Sumrall that he was humble enough to admit that he was a frightened man. For certainly, there was much to fear. Not only was Clarita's affliction, in the eyes of Dr. Lara and other witnesses, medically inexplicable, it also posed the terrifying possibility that any one of us could be attacked at any time by violent unseen forces. If such was true, finding a cure was absolutely necessary. Sumrall's first meeting with Clarita Villanueva took place on the 19th of May. By now, the young woman had been suffering at the hands of the thing for over two weeks. And, if the missionary's descriptions are to be believed, the activity had evolved in a very bad way. Clarita was slipping into demonic possession. Thus, after his initial meeting, during which Clarita is said to have made blasphemous statements, expressing hatred towards both the pastor and God, Samuel made the decision to fast for 24 hours, so as to be spiritually prepared to confront what he believed to be a demon on the 22nd of May, and hopefully deliver the young woman as God had promised. According to a report published in the Philippines Free Press, the journalist found Lester Sumrall in Clarita's cell, along with a collection of other prominent witnesses, kneeling on the cement floor before the stricken girl, holding both her hands by the wrists, praying. Dr. Lara was amongst those present, a man, so the article reminds the reader, who was accustomed to opening cadavers in the Manila Police Department morgue without batting an eyelash. Even so, he was shaky, wiping tears away from his own eyes as he watched on. After all, even as Sumrall prayed for Clarita's deliverance, she was still being bitten afresh by the indefatigable, invisible thing. In the words of the journalist, the sight of the bite sent a cold shiver down our spine. It did not in any way resemble a human bite. In the first place, it was too large for human teeth. In the second place, the bite was completely round. And finally, we were awed to discover that all the teeth marks appeared to have been made by molars. When the time came for the exorcism to begin, Sumrall at first insisted that exorcising the evil spirits was not a show, and that the journalists and additional onlookers should be kept away. As it was, they eventually found their way back into the cell. There, it is said that when Samrol invoked the Lord to liberate this little creature from the devil, Clarita's countenance changed. She, so the journalist wrote, became wild-eyed and screamed at the minister before her, telling him to go away. It is even said by some that she spoke in tongues and the English language, something which, outside of her entranced state, she supposedly had no knowledge of. Through all of this, Samrol remained alternating prayer and sacred song with invocations for the Lord's help, the pastor is said to have been unconcerned by Clarita's vocal and, on occasion, violent protestations. Indeed, at one stage of the proceedings, so the later news report alleged, the young woman became so violent and hysterical that she fainted. 
Even so, after about an hour, she is said to have started to soften. She supposedly became more attentive to the pastor, even responding that she liked Jesus Christ when questioned. They recited the Lord's Prayer together. After that, gesturing to the window of the cell, she stated that the thing had fled. She was, so she told Sumrall, no longer afraid of it or what it could do to her. At that, so the journalist wrote in 1953, a joyous hallelujah was sung. Just as Sumrall had hoped, the miracle of God came upon her. In the days and weeks that followed, Clarita is said to have escaped demonic relapse, with Sumrall continuing to follow her through the justice system, petitioning for her release when she was ultimately assigned to the Welfareville Institution for Wayward Girls. Today, the story of Clarita Villanueva is remembered as an early successful instance of Pentecostal exorcism, which in the 1950s was largely unheard of, such a rite usually the reserve of the Catholic exorcist. It is also, according to some, one of the earliest manifestations of Christian-style demons in the Philippines. And this is very interesting. After all, the involvement of Lester Sumrall and the designation of demonic possession has firmly established the Clarita Villanueva case as a Christian story. Summarily, that the devil and his minions terrorized a sin-ridden youth so as to mark her soul for hell. And, undeniably, this story does share many similarities with more traditional cases of demonic possession. For example, Clarita's aversion to the sacred, shown both when she expressed her hatred for the pastor and God, and also earlier in the story, before Sumrall's involvement, when she supposedly attempted to smash a statuette of the Virgin Mary. The holy ornament belonged to one of her cellmates, and it was only spared destruction after the two other women restrained the incensed young woman. Such, arguably, is a cut and dry hallmark of diabolical influence. In this way, much can be said about the Philippines being the most Christian-dominated society in the Southeast Asia region. Although the country is a secular state with freedom of religion, irreligion is very low, with Christianity being the dominant belief by a vast majority. Might it then be said that Clarita was merely acting out along Christian lines? A troubled young woman, undoubtedly influenced by Catholicism, seeking attention in an attempt to escape judicial punishment. Quite certainly, many skeptics will, and have, argued for such an explanation. And yet, this, in many ways, misses a more interesting point. After all, if we dig a little deeper, a treasure trove of intrigue can be found. Certainly, whilst it is incontestable that much of what Clarita demonstrated, from the aversion to holy objects, to her initial rejection of Christ, intersects Christian expectations of the demonic, there is also a lot in this case that converses with traditional folk belief, and even a wider, more syncretic, culturally universal view of the unseen. Along these lines, one might consider the Aswang, an umbrella term for various malevolent, shape-shifting creatures in Filipino folklore including ghouls, vampires, and specifically, viscera suckers. Clarita's thing, in many ways, resembles an aswang, a form-bending entity, at once a tall, dark devilman and a small, white-haired cherub that wanted nothing more, so it seems, than to bite her. Vampiric, ghoulish, flesh-sucking. In this way, her case can be said to look a little less like Catholic-influenced invention, and something which is more native to Filipino folklore. And the story becomes even more interesting when one examines a similar case, namely that of the Devil's Girl, the 11-year-old Romanian girl Eleonora Zugan, who, very similar to Clarita Villanueva, suffered moist, red, toothy bites all over her body after being attacked by an invisible being. In her story, which started in 1925, it was feared by some that she had fallen under the influence of a familiar spirit, a being described in Romanian folklore as elemental and temperamental. Loyal, if treated well, possessive and dangerous, if neglected. 
Thought to have become attached to Eleonora after she picked up a silver coin she found discarded on a roadside, the familiar spirit would attack the girl in front of others, invisible to their eyes but able to, as one contemporary report alleged, cause distinct teeth marks to appear on her wrist, then score like scratches on her right forearm, cheeks and forehead. Considering this, might it then be said that Clarita was experiencing something similar to that which Eleonora had encountered some three decades prior? After all, etheric shapeshifters and invisible fanged beings are hardly limited to the folk stories of just one part of the world. They are, in short, everywhere, and even overlap with the more formally recognised Christian concepts of the preternatural demonic which are said to be able to influence human imagination, to impersonate anything. The question is, why? Why is there so much overlap? In a world of separate cultures, different religions and diverse languages, why does it seem that we all return to the same basic concepts? Of there being an other world, an other world that can influence our own, an other world that is populated by all manner of ethereal beings some of them angelic and divine, some of them dark and toothed, wanting to bite and scratch and dominate and destroy in whatever dim, constricted corner you are unfortunate enough to find yourself in. Thank you so much for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe for more of the paranormal, being sure to click the bell icon to receive notifications of all new uploads. And if you cannot wait for my next video, why not watch the one suggested on screen now? Thank you again. Until next time.